Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Gulf Intelligence Daily Energy Markets Forum on Monday, May 24th, uh, where each morning we, we review the market open in Asia and the direction of travel for the day. Let's kick off with our regular Monday morning commentator, Mr. Omar Najia, Global Head of Derivatives at BB Energy. Omar, uh, it's a bit like Groundhog Day. It's Monday morning. It must mean oil prices are starting their ascent once again, uh, having uh, tried to get to 70 and backed away. And now we're up again this morning um, uh, out on Brent uh, 66, uh, high 66. Um, what are your thoughts of the market this Monday morning? Yeah, so basically uh, to kind of, you know, give you a kind of a coherent picture. So uh, on WTI, there is a, a low that we sent, uh, sent that we set recently at 6062. So as long as the market stays above 6062, uh, then I'm looking for a high, not a high. I'm looking for the moment for the market to move to a minimum of about $72 with a good chance, uh, 50, uh, 60, 40 chance of getting maybe to uh, 78. If we move below 6062 then basically I think that gets delayed a little bit. We test, you know, 57, 56, something like that. And then we go to the upside. So the trend is up. The only question is, do we get to higher numbers immediately from here without going below 60, 62? Or do we have to kind of uh, test lower uh, before we move up? The view on US equities is uh, wildly bullish. So they're at 4,100 now plus or minus on the S&P. I think that gets uh, to 4,900 um, uh, on this move up. Um, and, uh, and we wait and see all the cryptos, I think, you know, very interesting. Um, everybody's like, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the usual stuff, it's a bubble, it's evil, it's, you know, ransom, it's this, it's that, it's that. And when that get, goes away, which it will, uh, then again, uh, I think you get to see risk appetite come back in and drives those prices higher as well. Dollar lower. Dollar lower. Um, that's certainly been the trend, hasn't it? Dollar lower. Kevin Wright, lead analyst for Asia Pacific for Kepler. Kevin, what are the principal pillars of this uh, commodities rally, this blistering commodities rally 2021, has of course been China, Chinese demand. Are we seeing some cracks in that bionic demand that saved the markets last year? Excuse me. Good morning. Yes, it's uh, it's a very it's it's very much the case that China has driven the uh, the global demand picture over the last year. They were able to recover from the pandemic much more quickly than any other economy globally. Um, it's interesting you mentioned cracks um, cracks starting to appear because obviously you know the iron ore story remains strong, the copper story remains strong. But actually, in the last couple of months, we've seen quite a significant drop off in crude imports. Now, I know some of that is related to maintenance in China. You know, the, the big refiners there, the, the Sinopex and the Petrochinas and CNOC have all got maintenance activity at the moment. But we've seen close to close to a million and a half barrels uh, a day of throughput falling, basically, or you know, decrease. So, yeah, maybe maybe there's a little bit of a sign that, you know, the, the recovery isn't quite as robust. I would say, though, that, as I say, that, as I mentioned a moment ago, the iron ore and copper stories remain relatively strong, relatively convincing. Let's bring in Vitaly Yermakov, Senior Research Fellow of the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, sitting in Moscow, I believe, in Russia. Uh, Vitaly, the story of Iran's uh, nuclear talks with Russia, with the US and, and the permanent members of Security Council in Vienna over the last month has given the oil markets uh, some uh, sort of fragility and, and movement over the last few trading sessions the optimism that if there's a deal, the price tends to fall, the outlook becomes grim like it is this morning on some comments that there is no deal and so prices rise. What's the perspective from Russia and the East as regards this nuclear rapprochement with Iran? Uh, this, has, this has been going on for, for so many years now. And uh, as, as you say, uh, it gives uh, markets uh, a chance to uh, introduce a little bit of volatility into trades. Uh, really, we, we, we sort of, we are in a situation that 
those negotiations so sort of the the, the uh, hanging uh, uh, on a fence, so to say, and uh, which side they would go, uh, it's anybody's guess. Uh, strategically, longer term, it is in Russia's interests to have uh, Iran return uh, into uh, the global community. In the near term, obviously, yes, it, 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 it can affect all prices, but strategically, I think Russia really supports the resolution there. Uh, on a separate note, uh, you uh, talked about oil with Omar and about uh, other commodities with Kevin. I just wanted to throw a quick uh, note on, on the gas side, because it seems to me that this is where uh, the developments have been very interesting over the past months. Uh, Europe in particular uh, has experienced uh, this swing of the pendulum from uh, a relative abundance of uh, gas to scarcity and uh, on the back of relatively cold spring uh, uh, the inventory gas inventories in Europe has gone down and remained at extremely low levels and the gas prices in Europe have gone up uh, very very significantly and now everyone is desperately trying to uh, source LNG, but LNG has gone to Asia. Uh, we have heard this loud sucking sound coming from Asia and all LNG, flexible LNG obviously go, is going into this direction. So th this, is, this is a very interesting situation, which obviously affects the debates over Nord Stream. And, uh, we, yeah, the Nord Stream story over the last week has been a little bit confusing. There's been statements out of the US that would seem to indicate that they're kind of backing away from uh, their opposition and then they announce further sanctions or penalties for companies involved. How do you read that situation at the moment vis-a-vis -vis the American position mm -hmm. on the completion of Nord Stream 2, which is very much in the latter stages? Well, yeah, I, first, first of all, uh, a, a piece of clarity into this uh, murky business of sanctions. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the U.S. decided to not to apply the sanctions against the operator, uh, the operator company, uh, and uh, personal sanctions against uh, Matthias Warning, the, the head of uh, Nord Stream uh, operating company. At the same time, they did introduce the sanctions against the vessels, uh, Russian vessels that uh, participate in the construction. But these vessels uh, are really not vulnerable to any sanctions because uh, they are registered in, uh, with, with Russian companies that don't do any business whatsoever uh, in, in the West. So uh, in practical purposes, uh, it doesn't really change anything. Uh, more strategically, it seems that the U.S. has realized they, they, they cannot stop the project and uh, in practical terms, uh, trying to stop it would really hurt uh, Europe and Germany in particular because they would have to pay much higher uh, gas prices. And at the same time, U.S. LNG, as, as I said, uh, instead of going to Europe, has gone to Asia because this is where the price differential uh, is, 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 is leading them. So uh, it's, uh, it's really, I think it's, it's quite impossible now to stop the project, but the next line of defense will be about uh, uh, what levels of utilization can be allowed and what levels of transit why Ukraine should be secured still sort of the pressure on Russia would come to, to continue to uh, transit some gas by Ukraine. Omar, just coming back to your earlier point, uh, touching on cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, which you've referenced in the past as a, a, a sort of a, an indicator of risk on appetite, as it was, uh, you know, marching above $60,000. We've now obviously had a major correction, at least at the moment, which is not unlike the trend that Bitcoin has followed over the last five years, goes up a massive, comes down a bit, goes up another massive. Uh, but in terms of the immediate as a reference for risk on appetite in this uh, uh, recovering economy uh, of 2021. What, how do you look at that position now vis-a-vis -vis risk on, risk off? How do you interpret it? Sorry, you're on mute, Omar. Sorry, thanks. When, uh, Bitcoin, uh, when Bitcoin sold off, you saw an immediate reaction, uh, sold off not during the weekend, but during the week, you saw an immediate reaction on both the S&P and on oil. Both of them came off extremely hard. 
and I think basically that is that is uh, something that that it's an indication that basically people see that 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 link uh, in terms of sentiment, in terms of risk appetite uh, between the between between all kind of major markets. It's also you know people who uh, buy Bitcoin, some buy and hold it, some buy to speculate. And a lot of people are leveraged, right? So they they borrow in order to do it, or they trade with a thousand dollars, but they can buy ten thousand dollars worth of stuff. So they're highly leveraged. So I think all that kind of built into the market. And when you saw uh, people coming out of uh, coming out of crypto, you saw the rest uh, come off. And, and interestingly enough, it wasn't just Bitcoin, but all the altcoins, all the other coins, basically that came off a lot more than than, than Bitcoin. So going forwards, I think that the market, the market basically now uh, sees that kind of excess uh, having come out of come out of uh, Bitcoin. I think basically, um, uh, if you look at oil specifically, um, everything you've you, you've basically thrown everything in the market. You've thrown Bitcoin coming off 30, 40 percent. You've thrown people sh- saying shale is back. Uh, you've thrown people saying Iran is done, definitely 100%. Here we go. You've thrown India. You've thrown COVID. You've thrown variants. You've thrown nothing is going to change and demand is, you know, uh, going to do this or that or the other. And still, you know, the market is trading where it is. So uh, while while the market is in this kind of uh, this kind of and OPEC plus don't forget oh the increased uh, production and and cracks and I don't know what and and you know commodities well you know they some of them are good some of them not so good but we've got to really be careful and through all of that we have WTI trading at 63 64 so what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is markets are not uh, mechanical it's not like a watch so you know you wind it and then it goes click 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 it's more of a you know living breathing thing basically so you've it's like it's like you know you have a dog and you've, you've basically put it on a leash and then another one and then another one and then another one so eventually i'm telling you this thing and you have a free. few of them at the moment don't you you found yourself with two dogs during covid but yeah. kevin uh Speaking of the variants and all of the things thrown at the oil markets, um, last week did appear to be a glass half empty kind of week in the sense that it was the first week in many in which the oil price ended the week lower than it started. And we're seeing this morning uh, news out of Japan uh, that is somewhat alarming, A, because it's Japan and you would expect them to be in a much more efficient place, uh, that the COVID uh, wave that they are now facing, hospitals in Japan's second largest city of Osaka are uh, essentially buckling under a huge wave of new coronavirus infections. I mean, except for everything looks much more neat and organized, they're they're facing a kind of an India wave at the moment. Yeah, I think it comes down it comes down to the approach to the whole situation, right? So you you've got certain countries that basically close themselves down and are, are pursuing a sort of zero case policy. Um, China certainly was doing that. Taiwan was doing that. And and Japan also was closed down to a very significant extent. At the same time, whilst following that policy, they neglected to follow a policy of vaccination. And the Japanese rollout of vaccines has been very, very slow, very, very low. Now, I find Well, the whole of Asia is very low at 5% with first dose, whereas the US 35%, the UK higher. Well, again, it varies according to the uh, according to the country and the region because right. the Singapore rollout is something like a third, something like thirty three percent. Yeah, but that's but obviously you know, small beer, right? Yeah, there's only six million people here. Yeah, whereas you're talking and it's about a pretty, the pretty, the most organised place on the planet. So you would expect well, that they do it in an afternoon. <laughs> yeah, the chance of a fine thing. They've they've actually slowed the rollout here. Um, it was very rapid. We were three weeks between first and second dose initially. It's now six to eight weeks. They try and roll out the first dose to a larger portion of the pop- of the population more quickly. Um, but I think you know, looking looking at the case of Japan, it really surprises me that they took a slow vaccination route when they had the eye their eye on the Olympics for later this year and the influx potentially of first first and foremost athletes, but also spectators from around the world. So it, it seems to me there's an incompatibility between 
pursuing that zero caseload strategy and trying to open up. And I think that's going to be a hallmark of, of the development where we got, that, that we see over the next six to 12 months. Countries that have followed a zero case policy are going to really struggle to reintegrate themselves with the global economy. It's going to be the case with Singapore because of the way that Singapore interacts. It's a hub for trading, it's a hub for transport. And it's certainly going to be the case for, for other parts of the region that are dependent on tourism, that are dependent on travel, uh, and that haven't rolled out vaccines. Thailand, Vietnam, etc. So, how, how on terms of the the situation in India, um, are, Kevin, have we seen yet uh, the sort of full picture on the de the demand destruction from this uh, COVID wave in India, which is clearly still raging? Uh, still a massive challenge. How is it translated into demand destruction? It's, it's a, again, a very interesting sort of study. Uh, it's a tragic study, to be quite honest, but it's interesting to see how the situation in terms of demand developed over the course of last year. Uh, you know, we saw huge demand destruction across the third quarter. There were lockdowns, there was reduced industrial activity, therefore the diesel and gasoline consumption was, was way lower. And actually, as of October of last year, gasoline consumption was back at pre-COVID levels. So it looked like India had come through. Now, obviously, we all know the situation at the moment. We all know the, the actions and the, the, the strategies and policies that have brought about the current situation in terms of the, the second or third wave across the country. I mean, demand destruction without a doubt. We don't have full numbers yet because it, there is always a little bit of a lag and we're still right in the, in the eye of the storm. But if we see anything like we did see last year, yeah, you're going to see 15, 20% kind of numbers down versus where you'd expect them to be. Vitaly, we saw overnight a story that is probably leading uh, in most major uh, international newspapers this morning, and that was Belarus diverting a Ryanair flight uh, between two European cities uh, uh, that they... Uh, took uh, to arrest a journalist, a blogger. Um, it does seem that the the sort of growing tensions between Europe and the Russia, Belarus, whatever part of that divide you want to paint. But ultimately, this is a fairly significant uh, action. Uh, another aggravation into that crevice between Europe, East Europe, uh, Russia, and, and European Union. Your thoughts on that as an event? How is it being pre presented in Russia? Uh, is it a big deal? Is it not a big deal? Well, uh, first of all, let's, let's be clear. This is Belarus, uh, not Russia, that diverted the plane, landed it. And, uh, but apparently with Russian agents on the plane and so forth. But well, Russian agents on the plane? Well, all right. Uh, <laughs> no, there's there's always the temptation but, to. But what's Russia, your point? Russia, 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 Russia. Is your point uh, trying to say uh, that Belarus has nothing to do with Russia? Uh, well, uh, let's. Uh, well, it's it's a uh, it's a separate state. It has a lot uh, to do with Russia. It has a lot to do with uh, Europe. No, let's be clear. So let, would let's, you, let, would you just on that point, so we're clear? Do you think the Belarus president would make such a decision without a sense of in? Uh, not approval, but certainly cover from Moscow. Absolutely, I think Lukashenko. He's he's uh, he's gone wild, and uh, he, I I don't think he consulted with the Russian authorities about this particular decision because for him that would be first of all a relatively minor affair. I guess I, I stress for him, it be, it has become a huge affair, and I think it it is going to backfire at him, uh, and uh, well. Sort of history teaches us that we are very poor learners. Uh, just uh, this 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 event reminds me uh, uh, an event that happened in uh, in in the early uh, 19th century when uh, Napoleon decided to arrest and then to execute uh, Duchess of Anguin, uh, one of the uh, possible claimers for 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 the French throne. And Talleyrand at the time said, it is worse than a crime. It is a mistake. Uh, and uh, this might be exactly the phrase that describes the situation. This is probably a mistake. But uh, what Lukashenko thought was, all right, uh, if sort of this uh, opposition 
uh, leader who started uh, a website that was heavily criticizing president is sort of within his reach. Well, let's grab him because it looks like Lukashenko really uh, uh, sort of found himself in a situation when he uh, thought that there were threats on his life instigated by uh, the opposition with the support of uh, intelligence services, Western intelligence services. Again, that, that's, that's his perception of how things are developing. And so he decided, okay, well, I'm not going to stop at anything. If you want to kill me, well, I will, I will basically, I will treat you as enemies. And so he basically, he went into this action and uh, this, this opposition uh, per, uh, journalist, I mean, uh, blogger, he, he, he got arrested. Uh, and uh, now, uh, just because this happened, I think uh, Lukashenko essentially burned the bridges and uh, he will have to move closer to Russia uh, just by, by, the, by the logic of things in terms of uh, its opposition to uh, Europe. Uh, if you remember, for many years, uh, Belarus's position was really about trying to maneuver between Europe and Russia. And uh, Lukashenko has been extremely skillful in, in basically in uh, using this leverage against Russia, by the way, saying, okay, wait, if, if you don't give me subsidies, energy subsidies in particular, I'm going to introduce better ties with, uh, with Europe. And uh, he was at the same time talking to Europe saying, well, please give me some help and assistance and uh, treat me nicely and then I will not uh, deal with Russia. So th that was his uh, fundamental position. And now it looks, it, it would be impossible to play this game for him. Well, it's certainly a, a, a kind of, a, a, in, you know, it reminds me a little bit of what happened in Istanbul not so long ago. Not as dramatic, was that Istanbul or Ankara? Istanbul. Yeah, uh, not as dramatic, perhaps, but nonetheless, where you go into a consulate or you go into an airspace and you expect certain uh, international norms and, and rogue behavior begins. Uh, and you wonder if that extrapolates in multiple ways what that means. Uh, but it's an interesting story that'll have to be followed. Let's go to the survey question uh, and tackle the, the point that was made earlier to Kevin. One of the pillars of this year's blistering commodities rally, Chinese demand may be teetering. Uh, agree or disagree that uh, Chinese demand uh, may be teetering on the side of not being as bullish as perhaps we had uh, anticipated for 2021. Uh, agree or disagree on that point. Uh, China has made some fairly public uh, declarations about trying to curtail the soaring prices in uh, commodities, but inevitably, how are they going to do that is, is a big question. Omar, looking for the week ahead, again, where we started, uh, oil prices rising a little this morning. Do you, how do you see the week playing out vis-a-vis -vis last week by Tuesday, we were already above 70 and then fell away for the rest of the week. Could you see a similar trend this week? Um, to be honest with you, look, the, the, the market needs to make, so the market's consolidated for a long time, right? So that means basically everybody's... Um, it sort of hit uh, 65 for the first time three months ago, the end of February, and it's kind of hovered ever since. Um, yeah. On rent, it, it, that is. Yeah, yeah. So basically the market's been moving sideways, let's call it, uh, for a very long time, which means that it has a lot of uh, pent up energy, frustration, whatever you call it. So you're going to get a break and the next break is going to be significant. So either we move from where we are now, which is, you know, 64, 63, something like that, towards like $72, or basically we break to the downside and we go from 63, 64 down to about 57 and then back to the upside. But I think uh, the problem with that is everybody would like uh, the market basically to come off because they want to buy it. Everybody would like commodities to come off because they want to buy it. So even so it's very even much when, a net long market, isn't it? 80% of open interest on the long side. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean for a reason, right? So uh, if you look at it, if if China wants to reduce commodity prices and prices keep going up, what's that tell you? So I think basically, you know, at the end of the day, there is a reason why commodities go up. It's to do with the dollar. It's to do with fears of inflation, and it's to do more importantly with demand. 
because commodities don't basically you don't buy them and stick them in a fridge or or under the table you buy them to consume them they're consumable so people buying uh, lean hogs or live cattle or whatever it is they don't you know put them in their pocket and and, and walk about they, they actually use them uh, lumber the same wheat all the rest of it so they're going up for a reason people are bullish for a reason same with the s p for a reason same with oil for a reason so i think you know all of the markets are pointing uh higher and and that's to do with uh, you know the, the the state of the world economy we're coming out of this uh COVID thing uh u.s gasoline demand is back to um you know uh 2019 levels already and don't don't forget a lot of people were saying it's never going to happen we're never going to go back and people will never travel again and and Europe is opening up and people are driving European um, uh, traffic, basically, again, I think they released data last week saying that, uh, uh, again, at, uh, you know, 2019 levels, pre-pandemic levels, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And people will still point to India and say, well, look at India. And yeah, you can point to anything, but, but you, you've got to look at the broader kind of picture. You've got to look at a picture where the East has already recovered, even if Singapore has, you know, 10 cases or Vietnam has whatever it is. It's, it's, it's already a done thing. You've had vaccines and now people will say, yep, but there's a variant or there's a mutant. All that's finished. So the question is, where do we go from here? And I think basically we go uh, higher until or unless the Fed actually does something and says like, you know, we're going to increase interest rates or we're going to taper or we're going to stop buying whatever it is, then, then maybe people cool off a little bit. But right now, with everything coming out of uh, uh, lockdown, uh, Europe, the UK, the US, uh, I, th I, think, I think the outlook is, um, is positive. Kevin, uh, on that point, inevitably, the, the, the expectation or the outlook as to how much of that demand recovery is already baked into these sort of uh, record commodity prices. Looking at from a refinery perspective, uh, obviously, China and others in refinery maintenance season coming out of it now. Uh, could that be a lift for oil prices going into June, July, that uh, the end of the maintenance season? Uh, undeniably, yes. Um, we're in post turnaround. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we've seen a bit of a dip in March and April uh, on, on crude imports, in particular into China. But as we come beyond that, yes, that's definitely a fillet for uh, for, for crude markets. I just want to come back to a point that Omar made about us, you know, as effectively having exited and COVID being in the past. I don't think that's valid at all. I think there are a lot of countries around the world that would say that they are in the midst of the worst part of the, of the, of the pandemic, right? So if you look at India, undeniably, if you look at Vietnam, Vietnam had a fantastic record at the start of COVID last year, controlled it, contained it, and had almost no cases. It's now spreading, certainly in the northern provinces, and they, they are having it far worse than they had it at any point last year. So they would really dispute the, the, the argument that, you know, they're coming through it and it's a thing of the past. The only thing that's becoming a thing of the past is how much it gets reported in the global media. It, but it's still very much with us, and I don't think we're through the woods, or sorry, out of the woods just yet. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how Japan plays and if the cement, you know, cement, cement, sentiment of the Olympics there uh, still sort of teetering as to whether that will go ahead. It seems they're very determined for it to go ahead. Uh, let's give Vitaly the last word this morning and get the survey result um, and see where the view is. Disagree, Chinese demand is uh, not teetering ultimately when one disagrees with that statement. Uh, Vitaly, the big possible indic move this week might be the same as last week where is the iranian nuclear talks going we're expecting an announcement out of vienna today which would be um uh, if it's as expected an extension of the inspection uh, uh, regime that has expired with the iaea and indeed then that points towards perhaps uh, some uh, reconvening of talks later in the week, and then perhaps that final breakthrough. But that could be one of the, the big things this week. Anything else you're seeing for the week ahead? <clears throat> right, right. Well, there's this old saying that you can't enter the same river twice because the new waters are flowing in it. So we'll see how uh, it is going to go with the Iran deal. Uh, mm. I was watching the chat 
And uh, indeed, there was a uh, very good response about uh, prices in Europe uh, going up, prices in Asia uh, for, for LNG uh, going up. And uh, sort of to me, I, I basically I have the luxury of not uh, having to watch uh, the short term movements all the time, but I do watch the important markers. And to me, sort of this surge of uh, demand for gas, for LNG in Asia in general, means that uh, I think the, 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 the demand situation is healthy and uh, energy demand uh, in general is, is going to bounce back. Yeah, I think that is the sentiment game as to where the, you know, the camera is pointed, as Kevin pointed out, is certainly uh, indicators out of the US uh, that the lowest infection rate since a year ago, and then, uh, and that's obviously the world's largest economy, and then the emer some emerging economies, a very opposite picture, uh, and, and and maybe the the emerging economy of the UK, whatever it is, uh, might be um, <laughs> showing uh, signs there uh, that they are moving ahead with their, there was some concern over the last few days as to the Indian variant wouldn't be uh, strong enough or would be, could overwhelm the vaccine. It now appears that that uh, point is not going to be a problem as Omar himself pointed out last week, uh, that the vaccines are tackled all the variants that are coming at them, at least thus far. Let's knock on wood, that continues to be the case. There's a lot of geopolitics going on in the Middle East at the moment, so we thought we'd reach out to the former Prime Minister of Lebanon and have a sit-down interview with him to get his views on all that is transpiring in this region. We've got Turkey trying to rapprochement with Egypt. We've got Saudi Arabia and Iran sitting down and having talks apparently in Iraq. We've obviously got the Israeli-Palestinian standoff. So a lot to get, uh, I think, some greater understanding with. And so uh, we've uh, got in touch with Fuad Senora and he's gonna sit down with us for a feature interview and give us at least his views as to where the region is going coming out of COVID. That might be worth a listen to later in the week. But thanks, everybody. Vitali, Omar, and Kevin, really appreciate your time this morning and everybody else for joining us. We'll see you in the coming days. All the best. Thank you.